SQL. What is the difference in the way that data engineers write SQL compared to data analysts? This is a question I've been thinking about a lot recently because people have been asking, especially like, how do I transition from a data analyst to a data engineer? And one of the big differences that I often see is how we approach writing SQL. And really SQL is written by most technical folks in one way or the other, right? Software engineers generally like to use things like ORMs to write SQL or do more basic CRUD uh, SQL. But data analysts are a little more closely related, so we tend to see a lot of similarities in how we do some of our SQL writing. This video is really going to be more of a mini series of videos where we go over some examples of not just kind of the high level, like what are the traits of SQL by data engineers versus data analysts, but actually going into it and being like, hey, what is SQL for data engineers and what does it look like? In this video, in particular, we're going to go over the key differences, so the traits, the high level. We'll go a little bit into maybe some basic queries, but it's going to be focused mostly on the very big differences. And then we'll make videos on some of those key differences where we actually go through and write SQL. So let's dive into looking at those differences and some of the key clauses you might be using that are different and you might not have used as a data analyst. So the very first point I'd like to get across is that SQL, the actual like language and sets of clauses, generally isn't the hard part of writing SQL. It's actually generally things like the data model and how you're actually constructing the entire flow and how you're having to actually parse that data and reshape it that make it more challenging, right? Like you can learn all the clauses you want, but if you don't get a, an understanding of how to format data in such a way that end users can actually work with it, as well as create pipelines that you can rerun at any time of any day, you know, whether you're tired or awake and you know that the output will be correct, right? Like those are things that are important. That's why I usually like to tell people that the harder parts of writing SQL as a data engineer have to do with the data model. So how you're actually modeling and reformatting the data, capturing historical data. In fact, recently I was just talking to someone who that's why they're hiring me is because they're like, hey, we have the whole operational side. You know, we have built an application. It works great. But whenever we ask questions to our, our data team, they can't answer them because they're not tracking historical information. Uh, so you lose things like, oh, where did one customer live? A year ago well we just update the location field where they live and so we delete that old information and so we'll talk about that here in a second about tracking historical information and then building pipelines to be item potent right to actually create things that when you run them they are running the same every time and the output is the same every time but let's dig into what each of those things really mean and what they look like um, in production so the very first thing that I like to think about is backfilling. Backfilling is a task that all data engineers have to do and we kind of low-key hate it because generally it means you have to remove often old data that you are often replacing with either new data that's correct because you notice hey there's something wrong in our data we need to rerun either some specific dates or some specific maybe customers again because we notice some issues in the data set or maybe you're planning to add new fields and because you want to add those new fields you have to kind of rerun things depending on how you built the pipeline. And so this is generally what we refer to when we say backfilling, right? You have to like go back and rerun pipelines uh, because you have to recreate some data. This can be very tricky. I remember my very first job, like we basically had to have a run book saying like, here's how you backfill because if we didn't, you'd create duplicate data, right? Like we'd have to say like, okay, step one, run this delete statement for whatever you're trying to delete, right? Delete from this table for either a customer ID or a date uh, range. Okay, step one, and then step two, then run these uh, store procedures in this specific order to make sure you don't mess things up, right? So this is a very often painful process. Sometimes, especially if those queries take a long time to run, you have to make sure that, right, like you have compute, so to speak, right? Especially if you're on an older system, like on-prem system where there's just limitations on how much compute you have. And so you've got to find free time to run it, etc. cetera. Uh, at Facebook, for example, uh, the challenge there when we were backfilling is sometimes you could easily backfill thousands essentially of tables or partitions of tables pretty easily. The problem being is sometimes you'd run into places where you just have an error that it would just be because a data swarm, which is essentially airflow job would die and it wouldn't really have a good reason why you'd have to rerun it and just go back to make sure that everything ran correctly. Or another issue is that maybe a partition for a table that you expected to be there, it wasn't there until so there were all these little um, issues. But that's part of it. You want to make it so that you can create these pipelines so that if you want to rerun a thousand date partitions or essentially a thousand, you can almost view them as tables. It's easy to do, right? Like I don't have to go through and check all of them because it's a lot. 
I want to be confident that the way I'm running it, um, the way these pipelines are built, that I don't have to worry about things like duplicate data or inaccurate data getting ingested into the pipelines. And so that's a big focus of how we do things. And that's why you usually see, like when you usually see like a basic pipeline that's maybe more traditional in the store procedure approach, you'll see something like delete some data first and it usually has something like delete a specific date range or another way that people might delete data is delete a specific file if you're loading from sftp and then from there you might reinsert that data so it's delete step first insert step next and then maybe if you've got some updates um, those might run as well but again then you have to view it in the bigger context and again we'll dive into that more into a specific video about backfilling next another thing you have to think about that's somewhat related to like backfilling but also just how you track data is are you doing something like an incremental load versus a full load that is to say when you're loading a table are you going to completely recreate the table which is very easy I honestly suggest people to create just a full load if you've got like a thousand rows or something because it's like the cost of doing that is so cheap that maybe doing the incremental might be expensive. Of course, even there, there's trade-offs. If you need to capture some information that gets lost, you do want to think through your whole design. But if you know the data doesn't change and you're just needing to add in a few rows every day and it's inexpensive, it's a simpler approach, right? A full road is just a recreate. Don't have to worry about, hey, what data already exists in the table? We don't want to, we want to avoid, again, duplicate data. Um, it makes it very simple. Versus an incremental load, which as the name suggests, you're often incrementing or loading, appending, right, to the current data set. And in fact, if you recall, when I did my BigQuery video, right, like there was three states of inserting data into a BigQuery table that you could code. Uh, it was an insert overwrite. So it's a, basically a recreate. You could do an insert append, uh, which as the name suggests, you just append to the end of the table essentially. Or I think the last one is if the table is empty, you'll insert into it. But if it's not empty, you won't. But really, it's only those first two. So incremental basically is you trying to add on to that table. Generally, this is via dates or IDs. So those tend to be the two ways that people will increment onto the table. What was the last ID I loaded into this table? Okay, in this other table, let's add that in. Or you might do something like, hey, what dates are in the table? Let's maybe remove the last of the last date and then reinsert everything from the last date to you know moving forward. You might also do a like, hey, what IDs exist in this table? What IDs exist in our, our data that we're gonna try to load into and whatever's new, insert just those ones. So there's different ways you can kind of increment and append, but the goal is the same. We don't want duplicate data, right? How do we insert data without duplicating data? Next, another key thing that data engineers like to do is track historical information. That is to say, again, if I ask you, hey, I need to create a report, and in that report, I want to know the essentially regional sales based off of where our customers live of different you know, regions or states or something of that nature, and I want that broken down in the last four years. Well, that's fine if you track the history of that information. So if you know I'm a customer and I am currently in New York and I moved to Seattle, you need to capture that. When did I move? What dates? Etc. Otherwise, if you just have the most recent place that I lived, then the report is gonna be skewed, right? Okay, now all of the sales that I had are just gonna to go to Seattle, even though some of them should be broken out into New York, right? You want to capture that information. And so that's why I say we wanna track historical data. And I can't tell you the amount of times I've had customers have this exact issue, right? Or they can't track historical information because generally most operational systems, so most transactional systems that are just applications, keep only the data that they need, right? Because it keeps the database smaller and they're really just focused on operations, right? They don't need to know where did someone used to live. They only really need to know where do they live now. So this is why you'll see us do things like slowly changing dimensions or the other common approach is date partitions. And we'll kind of go over them here. So I've done videos on slowly changing dimensions several years ago, but there's several types. So if you ever look it up, you'll see like type one, type two, type three, etc. Personally, I've only seen type two and type six. I'm sure other people have seen others, but those are the key ones that I've seen. Type two is generally the most frequent that I've seen. That just says, so going back to that example where we have New York and Seattle, you basically have, you know, customer ID, the location that they live is, and start and end date, right? So you have, you know, customer ID one, New York, the date 2025 or 101, and then the end date will be filled if they've moved and it'll be null if they haven't moved essentially. So. That, that is what suggests, hey, are they, have they moved or not? So 2025, 0101, and then they moved in 2025, 0301. So that, that kind of is that range. You can see that range. Uh, and then you see the next row is, you know, Seattle, same customer ID, 2025, 
0301, and then the other field is null. To say that they haven't yet moved, right, that null essentially signifies that this is still essentially an active row. And that gives you the ability to then in the future actually report, hey, I want to report like based on where these customers were during different ranges of time, you can capture that information. Date partitions are a little easier to implement. So what I just talked about is actually, I'll talk about the clause that often gets used to, to implement that. But date partitions are easy to implement. It's almost kind of similar in that mentality of an incremental versus full load, where it's just you recreating every day, essentially a snapshot of the table. So on 2025-0101, you have one set of data. The next day, you don't delete that old data, you just create another set of data with a field that just says which date partition it essentially is. So the prior one was 2025-0101, this one's now 2025-0102, right? So now you just keep creating those snapshots and it just captures, you know, over time that change. And this works great when you just want to look at a specific date, right? Because then when you write this all out in a future dashboard or query of some sort, you just join all the tables, not just on the ID, so you have customer ID, but to remove the duplicate risk, you also join on the partition for the date. So that way you, for whatever snapshots, they're always gonna be on the same snapshot. And then as you go forward, whenever once someone's looking at, again, that whole example of New York and Seattle, they're going to filter it based on date and that information is going to be joined. And so if you go at uh, past 2025-0301, they'll be in Seattle versus when they were in New York. Now, this is when you likely start to see queries that are more specific to data engineers than they are to data analysts. So you'll see the clause merge. If you haven't heard of merge, here it is. Merge basically allows you to write an insert, update, or delete situation based on if you basically can take two tables and say, hey, here's my source table, here's my destination table. If you find an ID in both of these tables that match, I might ask you to do something, right? Generally, when you run into that match, you'll have a combination of an insert of a new row and an update of the old row. Some other important just one-offs, and again, we'll dive into this more um, and show examples in future videos. One is JSON parsing, right? A key clause that you can now use in pretty much most tools is some level of JSON parsing, right? And there's always been like XML parsing. I've used that a lot in the past, but JSON parsing, especially as JSON got more popular, it's now everywhere. So a lot of people, we can use that uh, as well as other semi-structured type clauses uh, that let you interact with lists and arrays uh, and other types of semi-structured objects in your query itself. So that's something you'll often see. So you can actually use it to parse JSON, which can be nice depending on how complex your JSON is. It can get very hairy. And I try to find a good balance of where should I deal with JSON? If it's very simple JSON, maybe I'll push it to the SQL side, but if it's very complex and hairy, right? And I need to start recreating tables and parsing out other tables, that might be something I handle more on the code side. But that's one thing you're going to see is parsing JSON, which will, again, we'll do a whole video on that. Another thing is you will likely have to get a comfortable with using the information schema. So if you've never done that, you can actually select data about your database. It's basically just metadata about your database that tells you, hey, what tables exist. Sometimes you need that because you're like, hey, I need to find all the tables with a certain prefix or suffix because I need to either remove them, delete them, something. You can find all the columns inside of a table, which can be nice if you want to maybe automate some process where you update all the columns with a certain naming structure. So it's a lot of this maintenance functionality. And again, we'll show you kind of how to query that information schema and why it's valuable and some examples of like, hey, here's real world examples of why this is helpful. And so these are the current things that when I was thinking like, what is the difference between how we as data engineers write SQL versus how do you know data analysts write SQL and like, what do we care about? These are like some of them. I mean, really a lot of it comes down to mindset. You know, the mindset just tends to be different. Data engineers, we tend to be building things that are permanent. We're building structure, we're building some level of infrastructure around data. Whereas analysts tend to be focused on building ad hoc workflows. This is why, you know, I often make the, the joke about like just in time data modeling or something of that nature, because it's really more about building something for a dashboard or something that's a one-off. Whereas data engineers are trying to build something that will be more permanent. And again, the whole thing about backfilling is about maintenance. You know, even things like the information schema, generally it's around maintenance and actually being able to build something that runs and is solid, right? You don't have to worry like, hey, if I run this again, Am I going to get the right data? We know we are because we've tested it. We have built it in such a way that when we rerun it, we know it's not going to you know, create duplicate data or delete data that we don't want to be deleted, right? Because that's another bad thing that could happen. You could delete data that you don't want. And so there's a lot of those things. And we'll go over more of that in depth as we kind of go along 
in the series. As you can see, right, there are some very big differences between the way we write SQL, whether you're an analyst or a data engineer. Hopefully this video was helpful and I'll keep kind of making them and really diving into the specific examples. If you have any other questions on SQL, please feel free to put them in the comments below. And with that, guys, I want to say thanks so much for watching this video and I'll see you all next time. Thanks all. Goodbye.